Thanks for coming to our pitch. Um, we're going to talk about node resources. What's a node resource? Well, you've probably heard of Kubernetes and Kubelet and container runtimes, maybe. And anybody needs to know a little bit more about container runtimes? Raise your hand. If you're good, if you're if you understand what those are, that, then that's great. Hey, about I'd say about six years ago, I'm just going to do a little intro, a um, little history, um, before hanging off to Christian. About six years ago, we were sitting around a round table doing the open container specification for runtime specifications. And a guy named Renal Patel, I don't know if he's here or not, but Renal Patel came up with an idea to do hooks in, inside of the run C runtime using some text that would go into the OCI specification. And those hooks would be executable programs that would be run at particular points at which a container is executed. For example, pre-start post-start, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but how would people define where, they, where would they put them? Okay, uh, there would just be a path in the OCI spec to where these, these application programs would be that would actually receive the contents of the OCI spec, maybe some state, and then reply back, um, you know, synchronously in, with maybe some modifications to the OCI spec, or they would do an attach or a resource and that's where node resource comes in. So the reason that people need to extend the, these container runtime engines, if you will, underneath the covers, is because resource managers need to be able to modify how the containers get access to the resources, how much resource they get. Um, and we, we try to do some configuration, if you will, in the container runtimes, but we always seem to get it wrong, and resource managers need to not just manage the resource for pods and containers, but also they need to manage the resources for uh, Docker containers, for you know, other kinds of container runtimes that are running in parallel on your node, um, paired in parallel with Kubelet and worker node pods that have been assigned. And Intel is one of the, the groups that always need to be able to have their own resource managers, and so they're, they're heavily involved. Uh, we, we did do, beyond this hook thing, we did an OCI spec, we, we, the container runtime groups put together a, this runtime schema for, for our uh, hook schema, sorry, um, that would sit on a directory and then a container runtime could bring in that schema, look at, look at the JSON for anybody who wants to do a resource hook inside of the runtimes. And some of the people didn't really want to just use the runtime schemas. They wanted to be able to hook into container runtimes themselves so that the, the modifications that the container runtime could be adjusted as well um, before getting all the way down into the bottom end of the, run, you know, the, you know, the runtime engines. So one of our plugins that we're looking at is actually the ability to use the, this, this hook schema to load up plugins that, you know, executable programs that will run at, at boot time based on your system D being, being able to, you know, modify th those configs uh, anyways and set dependencies. I right, don't probably into too much detail, um, but Christian has put together a, a great little plugin that will run in container runtimes so that you can actually have a, a process that's loaded by system D, for example, and then call into the container runtime over a TTRPC interface we might even do a gRPC one as well, but we're going to start with TTRPC, which is how we do shims in, instead of container runtimes. But this, this TTRPC interface will host the ability for a, uh, a runtime, a service, sorry, a, a resource service manager to be able to actually tell the container runtime it's interested in a certain type of sandbox, like a pod sandbox, for the ability to make modifications to it. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to Christian now. Um, he, he's a a great developer. We're about to merge a couple of his PRs into uh, Cryo and Integrity. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. And thanks everyone for joining this session. So my name is Christian Litke. I work for Intel as a cloud software engineer, uh, mostly in the orchestration and the runtime resource management area. So, <clears throat> So we are going to talk about NRI, the node resource, node resource interface. 
so what is NRI? So NRI is a common framework for plugging extensions into OCI-compatible runtimes. These extensions, or as we call them, NRI plugins, implement custom logic for controlling container configuration. So what do we mean by a common framework? Well, it's common because ideally NRI support should be present in uh, all common runtimes. And uh, also NRI plugins should work identically across all NRI enabled runtimes. It's a framework because it comes in multiple pieces which together achieve uh, the goal that we set for NRI. And that goal is to allow altering how the runtime configures containers without actually modifying the runtime itself. So the benefits, some of the benefits of NRI. So for runtimes, it's I think obvious, it is another way to share and reuse code. So in addition to just uh, using the same packages in the runtime implementations, there is now a common interface to plug in new functionality, which can be implemented once and then plugged into any of the NRI enabled runtimes. For cluster administrators, NRI provides uh, the necessary plumbing to customize or enforce how containers are configured. So this includes control over the initial container configuration during creation and any subsequent container configuration updates. So additionally, NRI also allows configuration changes uh, in, resp in response to external events, which are not actually from inside the container runtime. So essentially, if you plug in your plugin, so plug in your NRI plugin, your extension uh, into the runtime in your cluster, then you are free to implement your own custom logic uh, for container configuration, but only within the boundaries imposed by NRI. So there are certain things which even with NRI you are not, not able to or not allowed to do. So how does NRI work? So to explain how NRI works, we need to first take a look at how the container creation signaling flow looks like from a high level in a Kubernetes cluster. So this is going to be a vast oversimplification of what is going on, but it should be sufficient to understand in this context the necessary details. So first, a port spec is created. And this typically happens as a end result of creating some higher level object. Uh, for instance, a service, a daemon set, replica set, or something similar. So eventually, this pod spec ends up in the Kubernetes node agent, the kubelet, uh, on a worker node. The kubelet uses the container runtime interface to uh, request the creation of a pod and one or more containers within that pod. So the container runtime constructs from this CRI request an OCI specification. This OCI specification describes the containers parameters for the low level runtime. And this OCI spec is then passed on to the low level runtime, for instance, RunC or Kata containers, which then creates the container. So with NRI in the picture, so things work a little bit differently. So once the initial OCI spec has been created in the runtime, it is passed to NRI. And uh, in NRI, the NRI plugins can basically perform customizations according to their own logic to the, this initial OCI spec. Uh, and then this updated OCI spec, this final updated OCI spec, is passed on to the low level runtime, which then creates the container. <coughs> so there are other uh, container lifecycle events where NRI can hook in, and basically the details of the signaling flow are 
slightly different, but the important thing from the NRI point of view is that usually a request or always a request comes in via the CRI interface as long as we are talking about uh, Kubernetes clusters and, and Kubernetes containers. Uh, and then NRI is acting basically before that request can be finally processed and making modifications inside the runtime. So if we take a closer look at the NRI bits in this previous picture, so if we zoom in uh, and take a look at how NRI is uh, decomposed, so, so we notice that there are several components which work in tandem, and this is why we earlier called NRI a framework. So there is an adaptation client which is basically a runtime agnostic library to help runtimes integrate to NRI itself and interact with the NRI plugins. Then there is an NRI plugin stub, uh, which takes care of the low level boring details of writing a plugin. So this should improve, improve code reuse uh, because instead of each plugin author having to implement all the low level necessary functionality which are common to all plugins, they can, by using the stub, they can directly dive in and start focusing on the custom logic that they need to implement. So this stub takes care of things like connection establishment to the runtime, uh, communication, plugin registration, and so forth. So finally, there is the NRI protocol itself, which this, uh, these above, so previously mentioned two components. So the adaptation client and the plugin stub use to communicate and interact with each other. So the NRI protocol is defined as a protobuf based API with TTRPC bindings. The protocol defines an execution model uh, and the data model for NRI. The execution model is basically a set of potent container lifecycle events uh, which NRI knows about and plugins can be interested in. And the data model defines which subset of the OCI spec NRI plugins are exposed to and how this subset can be modified uh, by NRI plugins. So and a, another way of describing this would be that the execution model uh, basically defines the events and the data model defines the inputs and the outputs that uh, NRI plugins receive and produce while processing those events. So if we look into the events in more detail. So the NRI API defines an event subscription mechanism and plugins only need to subscribe to those potent container lifecycle events which they are interested in and they only get notified about those events which they have subscribed to. So currently pods cannot be modified by NRI plugins. Plugins can still track the lifecycle state of pods by subscribing to the available pod lifecycle events <coughs> and they can also act on those events. So because there are no possibilities for plugins to change anything in a pod, the, CR, the NRI pod lifecycle events are exactly the same as for CRI. So these are uh, pod creation or run pod sandbox, uh, pod stopping, stop pod sandbox, and pod removal or remove pod sandbox. For, contain, uh, for container lifecycle events, situation is a bit different because container configuration can be customized by plugins. So the NRI defined lifecycle events for containers are similar to the CRI ones, but there are a few additional post variants as we call them. So this full event set is create, post create, start, post start, update, post update, stop, which is semantically a post stop, and then remove. 
plugins can customize containers during creation, update, and stopping. Therefore, these events are actually semantical requests and not events. So plugins can respond to them with a set of customization changes that they wish to perform in response to these events. <clears throat> so if next we take a look at the data model, so plugin inputs and outputs. So for pods, again, because pods cannot be modified, <coughs> uh, the amount of data that we take from, from CRI and pass over to NRI is, is slightly smaller than for containers. So for pods, the available data includes the Kubernetes namespace, labels, annotations, uh, C group parent and the runtime handler. For containers, the data available to NRI plugins include the containers, labels, annotations, commands, so the command line arguments, environment variables, mounts, devices, OCI hooks, C group parameters, which are related to native resources. So these are skip CPU scheduling parameters, CPU and memory pinning, uh, memory and huge page limits. Uh, and I think that's it. And additionally, there are two classes or clauses. So one is for last level cache allocation, uh, which is called the RDT clause. And the other is for block IO scheduling and throttling. And that is called the block device clause. So the container event determines what kind of changes a plugin can request in response. So for container creation, uh, and actually this, so for, for container creation is the one where the largest amount of modifications can be performed by a plugin, and this directly comes from uh, the con underlying container model defined by the OCI specification. So once a container has been created, then most of its parameters cannot be changed, but there is a subset which can. <clears throat> and this is reflected in the pos uh, possible responses to these various events. So for, cont for container creation, uh, plugins can request modifications to annotations, environment variables, mounts, devices, OCI hooks, the resource-related C group parameters that I mentioned previously, the last level cache, so RDT, and the block IO clause or classes. <clears throat> so, and additionally, uh, for a container creation request, plugins can also request updates to other existing containers in the runtime, not only the one which is being created. So for container updates, the requested update can modify the resource-related C group parameters, both for the container being updated and other existing containers. And this is the same for stopping. So what else an NRI plugin can do? So there are a number of other things plugins can do. During registration to the runtime, uh, the plugin is offered a chance to synchronize its state with the runtime. So during the synchronization, it receives a full set or a full dump of all existing pods and all existing containers in the runtime. And in response to this, uh, it has the chance to do customizations to the configuration of any of these containers. And these customizations are exactly the same as can be done for a stop or an update event. So not the same as for create. <clears throat> Basically, resources can be updated, but not much else. Mm. So plugins can, of course, also subscribe and react to pod lifecycle events, but they cannot modify pods. Uh, and they can control things which are outside the scope and control of the OCI specification. Nothing prevents a plugin from doing that. Mm, there are also a number of things that NRI plugins can't or shouldn't be doing. So multiple plugins cannot make 
simultaneous conflicting changes to the same container. So this is uh, checked, caught by the NRI infrastructure, and it's flagged as an error. So basically, if this happens during uh, container creation or container update, uh, then it is sort of transactionally rejected with an error. Mm. So another thing that plugins can do is that they cannot control those parts of the OCI spec which have been intentionally left out of the NRI specification. So we try to be careful to include everything that we think is needed. Of course, there it is possible that something we overlook, but the rest of the parameters which cannot be controlled by NRI plugins are intentional. And although I said that NRI plugins cannot do such control, in reality, this is only true if NRI plugins are not trying to bypass uh, the runtime and, for instance, by direct SQL manipulation, make change, changes on their own to these parameters, which they should not do. So, <coughs> how to write an NRI plugin? So if you are interested in writing an NRI plugin of your own, then the easiest way to start is to copy the template plugin that we have and fill in the missing details. So the template plugin basically is a very few lines of code wrapping the stub just to be able to create an executable, uh, start it up. Uh, without any modifications, the plugin, so this template plugin simply subscribes to all events, and then it just prints out the events as, they, as it uh, is received. So, and this plugin does not make any customizations to any, any container. So basically it always responds with an empty, empty response. So, and the easiest way to get up and running is that you clone this one, and then you start modifying it. And how you need to modify it? Well, first you need to subscribe to the events that you need, because you probably don't want, or maybe you don't want to receive all the events. And then you need to implement the actual customization logic uh, for containers. So if you remember, there were three events uh, to which a plugin can respond with customizations. So those are the control points that you have. So to those, usually you want to subscribe. So these are the create container, update container, and stop container events. So, and what, what you want to do is that you make your initial customization in response to the container create, creation uh, event or request. Uh, and if your custom logic is such that the changes you are making to the container being created uh, have side effects or effects on the existing containers, then in response to this event, you typically want to also customize the configuration of existing containers so that this effect is somehow mitigated or reflected. So a good example would be that if you want to allocate, for instance, an exclusive CPU to a container, then it's only exclusive if you basically exclude the same CPU from the allot set of the other containers. Uh, so if you do this, if you are modifying, modifying other containers, so existing containers for a, for a uh, create container request, then you typically want to subscribe also to a stop container event because then you need to undo somehow those modifications that you did for the creation event, so in a way the other direction. Uh, and this is true also for, for update. So in addition to this, so these are all reactive changes or reactive customizations. So something, NRI is telling you something that something is happening in the runtime, a container being created, updated or stopped and then you react with 
with customizations in the response. But NRI also provides a mechanism for uh, doing unsolicited customizations. So, for instance, one example would be that you are collecting some kind of runtime metrics, and then based on that, those metrics, you would like to, let's say, redo how CPU allocation is spread across the containers so that those could perform better. So this you can do. Uh, there is with the update, update containers uh, call, which is actually control flow wise in the other direction. So NRI is not calling you, but you are calling into NRI, tell your customizations. These customizations are exact same as for stopping or update, so they are only to the resource related C group parameters, uh, block IO and RDT clauses. And then NRI will, will tell you whether this succeeded or not. And if not, then you need to somehow react to that. Uh, so those are the short guidelines of how to write the plugin. And of course, one good idea is to take a look at our sample plugins that we have in our repository. We have a few, not too many, but uh, those can be used for inspiration and guidance. And of course, we have some, some set of documentation. A little bit limited, but we are working on that. So examples and use cases. So we have a few plugins already available. So some of those are real world plugins because those have been written uh, to mimic existing similar functionality in some of the runtimes. It's sometimes questionable whether those use cases are such that you, that they really make sense nowadays, but nevertheless they exist. And we wrote those in the hope that once NRI is merged, then some of these could be removed from the core of the runtime and then made available as a NRI plugin. Somehow keep the core a little bit uh, more manageable to prevent this kind of, I don't know whether I should call them customer specific additions, but that's a little bit how those look like to me. So keep those out. Uh, and rather implement them as NRI plugins. So these real world ones that we have, so one is an annotation based device injection. So if I recall correctly, I saw this code in cryo, then I, but okay, I will implement this NRI plugin. So basically it reads a annotation with a well-known key and then interprets the value as a description of a device, device parameters which should be injected into, into the container and then it injects it. Uh, then we have another one, the CDI device injection, which is by now obsolete, but it's still available. So this is basically, uh, so this is how we initially implemented CDI device injection. So if you know, if you don't know what CDI is, so CDI is basically the low level device description format used by the upcoming DRA or dynamic resource allocation feature in Kubernetes to inject devices into containers and manage them a little bit better than you can do with, uh, or actually a lot better than you can do with, with traditional device plugins. So this was easy to implement as, as, a, as an NRI plugin. So it was one of the first sort of test cases for ourselves that do we have enough functional coverage that some useful things can be done. But because we did not want to uh, we did not want to add a dependency between, so from the array to NRI. So we wanted to completely decouple those then. Eventually we implemented natively this in both cryo and container. That's why this is now obsolete. <clears throat> then the third one, I think it's Mike's favorite. <laughs> it's the OCI hook injection. And that is basically, so in cryo you have OCI hook injection support, but you don't have it in container day. And this has been a long standing discussion. Several times have been attempted in one way or another, but the PR did not really ever go in. Yeah. So, and then we decided that maybe an array plugin would be a good idea because then it's not a configuration option, but you can completely leave out the code. So if you need to lock down some in some environments, container day, so that this is absolutely not possible, then to assess this is a little bit easier if you simply don't have the plugin present on the system, then just take a look at the configuration. So this code has almost verbatim 
been taken from the cryo implementation, uh, turned into an NRI plugin. It's really just a few lines of code. And if you have a NRI, NRI enabled container day and then load this plugin, then it works exactly identically how cryo would handle uh, the schema based OCI hook injection for a container. There is one more real world plugin on our to do list, and this also comes from the cryo code base. So cryo has a, a built in, they call it high performance hooks. So this is a really good example, actually, of uh, some functionality where you react to some container lifecycle event, but then you perform actions which are outside the realm of the OCI specification. So this piece of code is not there for fun, but it's there because the same thing cannot be done by, by the OCI specification. And the reason for that is that Nowadays it does also other things, but, but initially when I took a look at it, so <clears throat> one of the things it was doing is that, that if you, so when you create a, a guaranteed QoS container, and that container gets an exclusive CPU allocation, then it was basically migrating, or it is migrating off all the interrupt handlers from those CPUs which have been assigned to this container so that uh, actually your user space processing is not getting preempted by kernel level IR handling. So this is providing even more isolation from, from the rest of the other containers and, and, system, and the processes running on the system than just by getting a normal exclusive CPU. And when that container is stopped, then this migration is done in the other way around. So it or the, so the IR co-handling state is restored to the original. So we haven't, we don't have a plugin for that, but this is one of the, because this is something that we promised for the cryo force that we will do. Um, then we have a couple of debugging and development plugins. So we have event logger. So that's an easy way to uh, take a look at what is going on in the NRI sense in a runtime, so it registers itself, so the, the logger registers itself uh, to the runtime, it subscribes to all events, and then it does a full dump of every single event it receives. And it never uh, requests any customizations, of course, to any containers. So in that sense, it's a knob plugin. Then we have a container differ. So that is, a that is basically a modification of this ID. So instead of that, that basically works by the same principle. It registers itself, subscribes to all events, never does any customizations. But instead of dumping the events, it only dumps diffs uh, between the chain of customizations that several plugins are requesting to the container. So if you have more than one, then you can see what is going on. And then we have the plugin template, which is the, basically it's a, it's a simplified version of the logger. It's not doing verbose logging, but otherwise it's almost the same. And then we have one more experimental plugin and uh, so that is a modified version of a, I would call it an experimentation vehicle that we have been now for a couple of years using in our team to experiment with various resource assignment policy improvements for the orchestration and, and the runtime space. So originally it was written so that it so if you remember the kubelet and the runtime communicates with something called the CRI, so the container runtime interface. And the original implementation of this is a resource, so a CRI proxy. That's why it's called a CRI resource manager. How it works, towards the kubelet, it presents to be the runtime. Towards the runtime, it presents to be the kubelet. And as the requests are passing by, it is just consulting its own policy that, hey, what should happen, and then does the customization by modifying the CRI requests. And because this is a <coughs> some 
kind of a hack. So we decided that since we have now possibility to do to do much of these same things with NRI, so we modified it that we added the NRI plugin support to it. So if you give it a special common line option, then it registers itself uh, to the runtime via the NRI interface and then does all the same things that it would do over the, the CRI proxy method, but using NRI customizations. Mm, what else? I think that that was all. So, do you want to say, Mike, something about the current status? Well, so, where we are? We're, we're close to merging the PR. Okay. <laughs> it looks so, good. So, in container, they, uh, we are close to getting it merged, but it's not, not yeah. there yet. Yeah. Scheduled, scheduled for 1.7 container yeah. D, um, but minor getting there. go dependency mm -hmm. issues. Yeah. Yes. We'll, we'll, we'll get that resolved. Maybe Monday. Monday. Okay, so if you want to take a look at NRI, so currently you can do it so that you are, take, you, for instance, close clone from those pending PRs, or you can wait until we get those merged, and then, then you can get your hands dirty with it. Any questions? I think we're probably close on time. Um, do we have any extra buffer between now and the next? Ah, cool. Cool. Thanks, Christian. Um, questions? Anybody have any questions? All oh, right. One over there. Hi. Um, just a simple question. The NRI plugin, do you have any kind of mechanism for dependencies between NRI plugin, or they have to be no, so, standalone? So we want, <clears throat> it's a good question. We want it to start very simple. Uh, so we recognize that it might be possible that you want to split up your full processing chain into smaller components because it might be that you want to just in some configurations do part of it, but not all. We have done, we have our own tests for that. Uh, but we wanted to start very simple, so basically we went with the traditional init style index. And this is something that we later might change. If it turns out that, that that's a sort of dominant usage pattern, but at the moment for us, it has not been. Um, so. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's no reason you couldn't just set up some system D dependencies, run your plugin. Each of those plugins would be, have their own requirements, right? And then call into the TTRPC so if you, API. If you start by system D then. Pattern. We'll talk about these yeah, patterns. If you start it by system D then, system D can do this for you. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Control the order of the plugin. Everybody wants to be first and everybody wants to be last, right? So yeah, so basically, okay, sorry, I forgot to say that this, that's how it goes, that the plugin, when the plugin registers itself, it gives an index and a name. Yep. And the index is used to order them, and that's it. A name is used to basically pass it some configuration if, if you want to manage your configuration via that way, and that's it. What are the security implications for running something like this? So... <clears throat> So for the security, so we try to leave out everything which is directly related in security in the OCI spec. So seccom filters, system calls, none of it you can touch via NRI. Uh, but currently it is so that the NRI has no any kind of uh, access control with various privilege levels. So once if you are able to connect to the NRI socket, if you are able to register yourself, then you can do whatever is possible currently with NRI. This is something that we have discussed with Mike, that, you know, do we need something like that? And I think this is something that we need to, so we need to experiment with this whole thing a little bit more, and then we will understand whether such a thing is needed or not. So currently, we think that it's enough that you either lock it fully down or you let somebody in, and then, because our, ex, so our, <coughs> We try to mitigate this security implication so that we just left everything out that we think is problematic potentially. That makes sense. Are you plan potentially planning, are you currently thinking of like uh, policy system or yes. something like that in order to... So we, yes, so this, uh, we had this one 
So the CRI resource manager, that's basically works so that it has several built-in policies. So what we were thinking is that we, we would like to, so once this is merged, then, then we would like to rework that so that we rip out all the CRI-based code, we clean it up, and then we would like to split it up to smaller pieces and then make it available a little bit like the stub. So the idea would be, hey, if you want, because you can do other things than just, risk. so you can do other things than actual resource management with this, like the OCI hook injection. But if you want to do with resource management, if you want to experiment with that, if you would like to you know, disable the corresponding components, the CPU manager, memory manager, topology manager, in the kubelet, and you would like to try doing it here, then the idea is that, that we will turn that into something that you could start from and just, you know, it has a little bit higher level abstraction than this one, so it has a much closer to, so it has things like allocate and release resources and that's it. So then you implement and program against that interface, which is resource assignment specific, and then you could, you could use that. But we don't have at the moment that cleaned up and, and modified in this. It's a, it's a great question, right? Yeah. It's gonna be default off, however, the whole, well, the, the, yeah, and the, and the point of this, right, is that some of those hooks we talked about, some of the w ways that you do resource management already, I mean, it already exists there for root, right? So we're trying to put together a higher level process where we can start managing this with policies. Right. For example, if this pod is immutable, that could be a policy that we could hand through, right, and then say, oh, oh, sorry, no hooks, because it's immutable. Right? Control the implementation, let's make it work. Come help. And, and Exactly, exactly. Thanks. Thank you. First off, my apologies. I missed your whole talk. I just came here. Cool. So here's my question. Here's my, the problem that I have, and I'm just curious if this would help. Uh, I'm with a company that has a storage solution, and we need to install a kernel driver. Yep. Right now, there's, there was S, SRO, which was the special resource operator, OpenShift specific, the genealogical dead end. Yep. KMMO is the replacement, if you're familiar with KMMO. Okay. Does this help? Yep. Yes. Could you talk about it? So in your particular case, you would want to have a plugin that would actually do the install before the first pod ran, or before the first container run. So would it be instead yeah. of KMMO, or with KMMO? It would just be a plugin that registers interest in making sure that that dependency has been met. That would be one way to do it, right? Okay. Other, other, or you could just run and your own little. Thing, and I think my apologies to the, the, what does it mean to say that's a dependency that needs to be met? Well, you, you said yourself that you needed your resource to be installed, your, yeah, your application. Yeah, yeah. Before application pods, for example. Exactly. So it's a, a dependency that you have. So that's 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 yes. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I look at the GitHub. It's an interesting one. Go so ahead. So did I, inter did I understand it correctly that basically the problem is that, that so in connection with some of, the, some of the life cycle events, you want to do something on the host side, so install something yes. to make sure. Okay, yeah, that should be possible. Right. And it could be also dynamic, right? Sort of. So Mike, I think we are out of time. Out of time? Uh, one more question. And then come forward and yeah. ask questions. Thank you very much for delivering a great talk. I really appreciate that. Um, I have a question related to container and cryo configuration itself. If you look at how to integrate that, there's a lot of manual steps, go do that, system D and blah, blah, blah. Can you, uh, is there a road plan, a map that to simplify that step? Uh, maybe some folks, just like you mentioned, do something. Because manually changes wherever you're making, there's a greater chances that a failure or something goes fishy. It'll, it'll, yeah. Thank yeah, you. It'll, it, for administrators, there's going to be more work to do, different work to do, right? You can currently configure your system in, in, in cryo to do this by putting your, your, your hook schemas in a particular location, just the administrator has to set it up, and you, you know, with the defined JSONs for what's going to run at the particular point in time. Uh, and this just sort of modifies that so that you no longer have to do that administratively. But again, each resource manager may have its own complexity. We haven't, we haven't made this simple for users yet. This is more of a, for developers and the owners of the resource managers. At this point, we're, we're gonna have to, as he mentioned earlier, we're gonna have to look, work on policies and that's gonna, it's gonna mean we need more declarative, right, 
specifications that are going to be set in your pod spec, make it simple, bring it down, pass it to the container runtime through CRI, and then and we can just execute it with the plugins receiving the information for the policy requirements. It's not going to be easy, but we'll, we'll get to it.